Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hi, I'm Paul Lancaster in University Relations at Virginia Tech, and we're going to be talking about a unique experience of research in Africa with Taranjit Kaur, who's Assistant Professor of Biomedical Sciences and Pathobiology in the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech. And Taranjit, kind of set the scene for us. You were over in Tanzania for a year with your family uh, studying chimpanzees. Where were you? What was the setup? How, uh, how did you operate out of, uh, what did you live in, for example? Talk about that. Let's set the scene. Well, actually, we lived in the forest uh, for about a year, but it took three or four months just to get ourselves there and get our uh, physical space set up and established there. Um, we traveled, we left Virginia and traveled to Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania, and uh, waited for the shipment of our solar-powered laboratory. And um, after some period of time of dealing with all the importation officials, we uh, cleared it through <laughs> customs and cleared it through the other officials um, and took the container and put it on a truck and trucked it across this, the country to western Tanzania to the most remote region. And from there, it was unloaded manually. Um, this is a 40-foot container. Uh, it had a boat in it, and it had many, <laughs> many pieces and parts of a portable laboratory that we designed here at Tech. And uh, we put it on a, another boat, and we sailed down Lake Tanganyika um, for about a 13-hour boat ride until we got to our destination at Mahale and set it up there. And, and Mahale being Mahale National Park. Mahale Mountains National Park. Okay. Yeah. Why there? Is, that, is there a chimpanzee population there that's uh, accessible even in this remote area or is it an area that's uh, been, there's been a lot of people interaction with chimpanzees? Why, why that particular area? Um, I've been going to Mahale since about 1994 and um, it's, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, it's a peninsula that juts out over Lake Tanganyika, and there's a very large population of chimpanzees there, probably the largest left in Tanzania, and there's one group in particular, a habituated group, and that, that means that they tolerate human presence for long periods of time, and um, they've been getting sick since about the early 1990s. They've been showing signs of respiratory disease and becoming ill, and um, we, we were heading there to investigate while, why they're becoming sick. There were three serious respiratory outbreaks uh, in 2003, 2005, and 2006. And by sick, uh, uh, to the point of dying in some instances. Oh, yes, yes. Morbidity and mortality, and uh, mostly the, the young chimpanzees are dying, those less than three years of age which is not a good way to help the population be stable or even increase. Exactly. We need those, we need those infants to grow up and reproduce in order to continue to, to uh, sustain that population. I guess somewhere along the line it became an idea that perhaps the sickness was coming from humans because of the fact that this was a habituated population. Is that where you kind of focused your study? We did. Um, chimpanzees are very close to humans, the closest of all great apes, of all, of all species alive on the planet today. They're closest genetically. And um, infectious organisms can jump between any species uh, and try to sustain itself in another host. But in this case, because of the close relationship genetically and the close proximity now between humans and chimpanzees. See, before there wasn't that close proximity in the wild, mm. but now with uh, with the increasing human population and globalization and ecotourism and uh, forest fragmentation, all of this is allowing humans to come in much closer contact to these wild primate populations. And so it puts chimpanzees and other, other great apes and primates at great risk of uh, exposure. Well, you mentioned ecotourism, and I want to focus on that a little bit because obviously this is a way that uh, Tanzania can bring in money to the economy 
uh, without you know tearing down the the rainforest or, and 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 digging up resources and using things up. Uh, and I, the ecotourism business had been growing for many years there, and now there's this potential problem that could be very threatening to the ecotourism population or uh, program. I would think. Yes, and and that's w certainly one way to look at it, and I I think you have to see that ecotourism is a very important part of the national economy and the local economy. Mm -hmm. And people there really don't have a lot of opportunity for jobs and a livelihood, um, particularly in these remote areas. So to bring in tourists from the outside and to be able to um, bring in money into these areas to help these populations is very, very important. So uh, you've got to find that balance, I think, Paul, between ecotourism and, and researchers coming into the area. It's also an important income generating opportunity for the, for the local people. So you've got to f we've got to find that balance somehow where, where we can do both and do both well. We talk about research co researchers coming in. Let's, first of all, uh, you did not do this on your own. You had support from a number of organizations. Who, what kind of support have you had to, to do your research there? I've received uh, a power award and a career award from the National Science Foundation. Um, also, Virginia Tech has received an advanced VT award, which is um, set up to advance women in science and engineering, and I received a seed grant from that. So between my career award, which was the biggest uh, <laughs> and the best, mm -hmm. um, and then the contribution from the advanced VT, um, I've been able to launch this program. Well, I wanted to mention this because people I don't know, I may not figure out that this is expensive stuff to do, and this was certainly an expensive enterprise. Uh, I want to talk about uh, how you set up there once you lugged all this equipment to the uh, uh, National Park. I want to talk about that laboratory. It's, it's, it's known as PLUG, Portable Laboratory on Uncommon Ground, designed by folks in architecture and urban studies. Uh, we've got some footage of it so we can show people what it looks like. Um, looks pretty good for a weekend kind of stay, but staying there for a year, how did it work? Uh, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. Uh, being in the jungle any way you cut it for a year sure. is tough. Um, we, um, the, the biggest thing was the solar power system, and NSF funded that in its entirety, and that was designed um, to really meet our needs. We, we worked with uh, a company, and we said, these are the items we want to generate power for. This is how much power we need. This is how many hours a day we're going to use this power. And so the, the real central theme there was solar power. And so anything we needed energy for, we had to be at that site. Other, other uh, support for uh, sustaining ourselves, we could um, do somewhere away from the lab, like we could build fires and things like that for cooking and other things. But really when it came down to lifelines, communications, um, running equipment, um, having uh, lighting and any resource for uh, being functional outside the normal daylight hours, we had to have that solar powered laboratory in that space. When you mentioned the equipment and there was a maybe not full scale in terms of what happens in the United States lab, but it was a pretty pretty large and functioning laboratory that you had in there. Yes, it, it is, and um, it met our requirements. Now at this point, we, we're gonna plan to build out and do the next generations sure. of a solar powered lab and, and uh, make certain improvements. We now know what we would like to have to do more, to do better, uh, quicker, smarter, faster. <laughs> always, always uh, the the goals to go by. I want to talk about some of the footage uh, that uh, we have on 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 video that was taken over there. Um, for one thing, there's some footage of you interacting with the chimps, and there's an, a very interesting sequence where you're walking down a path and they start following you, and then you take action to make them feel more comfortable. What was that? You you get down and simulate how the chimps are moving, it seems. Talk about that. Yes, um, that was an in-the-moment response for me. I, I felt very um, honored by the fact that the chimpanzees decided <laughs> to follow me. That was not something I, I 
expected. I did not lure them. I did not entice them. I didn't have food with me. I had n nothing with me that would even indicate to me that they may be interested in, in being with me rather than me wanting to be with them. Um, so um, for some reason, they decided to follow me. And my response in the moment was, well, let me be with them. Let me do what I can to make them feel more comfortable. And that's when I decided to go down on um, all fours and be more at their level and show them that I wasn't a threat and that I wouldn't mislead them. Um, I think the most dramatic part at that point for me is in the moment when I stopped to look back to see their reaction to me. Um, and they stopped and they looked back. And it, I, just, I, I just was so astounded by that response hmm. because they're so intelligent yeah. and they're so sensitive. And they were so at peace with me and so connected to me in that moment that they realized immediately, maybe something's back there and she's trying to, to show us. And they just mimicked my behavior precisely as if we were one. So. It's really a, a very uh, special moment in my life. Yeah. Well, I, I know, you know, observing them for a year, obviously you have to get close to them and just, you know, uh, the idea that they are habituated to humans. I, I did notice that, uh, of course, you took the precautions all the time of wearing the mask, and that was very, a very important part of your research is to not make things worse by being there. And, and, and that, again, is what you're looking at in the first place, is how the human interaction has affected the chimpanzees. Yes. And, and that goes back to our lab, too. Our goal was to create an eco-friendly lab, to, to do whatever we needed to do to go into their space, their space. That forest is their space. Mm -hmm. um, and leave the least environmental impact that we possibly could. And that's, that's part of wearing the mask. And how much can we really do to not harm them, to not influence them while we're treading on their turf, so to speak? Yeah. Another, another thing, you're very emotional about the, the contact you had with them. And another thing I know that struck you was um, the mothers and children. Mm -hmm. Talk about that, because that, that seemed to have a, a pretty big influence on you. Yes. Um, I have a daughter, Simran, and she's, she's now five, but when we left uh, for Africa, she was three. And um, I find it challenging as a working mom to have all the time I want with my daughter and uh, fulfill all her needs. And having the time in Africa with her um, was very important to me. And through observing the chimpanzees, I began to understand and appreciate that mother-daughter relationship so much more. Um, if you, you take away having to rush out the door in the morning to get the work on time, you take away having to dress your child to get them to school on time, you, you take away all the mm, man-made, if you will, introduced components of life, the structured life, and you just be there with your daughter, like these chimpanzees can be with their infants. You can see the ongoing interaction and the attention to their every need and the immediate response, independent of the other influences. And um, many times I could feel that when I needed to bring something to closure, to, to rush off and do something else, that if in fact I was living under native conditions as a chimpanzee mom, um, I may want to rush off to get food for my infant or for myself. But the fact was I didn't have all these other complicating factors <laughs> that the outside forces that were telling me how fast I had to do it and what I had to do and when I had to do it by. But they do the same things, Paul. They have that compassion, they have that love. They have that connection. The other female chimpanzees, the, the ants come in and they help and they babysit. And, and it's, really, it's really quite amazing to see that in its purest form without those outside structural components. Oh, neat. It's uh, um, you know, all this observational stuff that's going on while you're, while you're actually you're doing research too. Um, I want to talk about, uh, we ha there's some footage of you taking samples of what the chimpanzees live, left 
behind. Uh, is that was that the main way that you went to try to find out what was causing them to become ill? How did how did that work? You collected samples. Yes, there, there's there's there's. Uh, a couple ways. One one way to get information is observation, pure observation, sure. and see what they're doing. Look at their clinical signs for disease. Um, are they eating? Are they drinking? Are they coughing? Are they sneezing? What what is their behavior in general, and and what is their um, their apparent uh, bodily functions? The other part is uh, what goes in must come out, <laughs> or we are what we eat. So in the case of chimpanzees, they're an endangered species. Uh, we're not able to immobilize them, to dart them. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't just dart them um, inadvertently and, and try to pull blood samples or tissue samples. Um, so in order to collect information, one good way is to look at, look at their stool and see what is in their stool that is representative of what's going on in their body. And um, that's what that's what we did to find the uh, the causative agent of the respiratory disease outbreak. And what about the causative agent? What what did you find? What what are your conclusions at this point? I know there will be more work to be done, and we'll talk about that. But what where do we stand as far as knowing what's going on? Well, we know of the three outbreaks that I investigated, 2003, 2005, and 2006 that the clinical signs that were observed in the chimpanzees were very similar, if not identical, to those observed in humans with uh, certain respiratory diseases. In 2005, um, we have a fecal sample that uh, shows a virus, a paramyxovirus, that's uh, indicative of a uh, organism like a metanuma virus, a pneumonia virus that we see in people. Mm -hmm. In 2006, we actually um, have collected, the fe have the fecal sample in hand that we analyzed, and we found not only was it a paramyxovirus similar to what you see in humans, but it was 99% identical to a human metanuma virus, like a pneumonia virus mm -hmm. that is uh, newly emerging. It's a newly emerging pathogen. Um, being found around the world now, primarily in children, but also in adults and immune compromised people. It's uh, first identified in 2001, so it's only been on the books, so to speak, for about uh, seven, eight years, and now we found it in the chimpanzees. Well, that's scary. Not only do they have to deal with what's been around forever, but there's new stuff to, to deal with, too. There's new stuff, and um, it's being brought into the forest, into their into their habitat, um, and they haven't been exposed to it before, from what from what we gather sure. so far. The uh, couple quotes I want to uh, talk about. One is in a uh, summary that was written about your experiences that there is now powerful scientific evidence that chimpanzees are becoming sick from viral infectious diseases that have likely come from humans. Is that a reasonable? Conclusion. It, it doesn't state it unequivocally, but it, that seems to be where we're headed here. Yes, and it's mutual. I mean, these these chimpanzees are very close to us genetically, and the viruses can jump from chimps to humans, from humans to chimps. I mean, we've seen it with the HIV/AIDS pandemic, where that's believed to be um, a virus that has jumped from chimps to humans. So uh, they can go either way. You wrote a commentary in the American Journal of Primatology, uh, and there's a quote in there that, that really hit home for me. People have been too comfortable in the chimpanzees' living space. That's what this is all about, is that the, the ecotourism, while bringing in money to the economy of Tanzania, has maybe gotten a little too close to the situation. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, I think you know, hindsight is always 2020. Um, and I think that with the best intentions, people have have come into closer contact with great apes, and, and Mahali is one example of many. Um, unknowingly, perhaps, things have occurred that could have seeded that habitat with infectious organisms that the chimps were not prepared to, to deal with immunologically. So. Um, I think we're learning that um, we need to go in there, we need to do surveillance, we need to uh, 
determine what infectious agents have been introduced and figure out just what interventions are required in order to prevent this from, from continuing. Um, because it, it certainly, infectious diseases can spread like wildfire. And once they get into a population, into wildlife, sure. they can just keep perpetuating. Um, and so we've really got to get, get out there and, and find out what we can do to, to prevent it. So, so now we know. We have the evidence. We know. It's no longer speculation. It's a matter of fact. I wanted to uh, point out that Tanzania has not let this go unnoticed. They, they do require masks on tourists in the area, as I understand it. And they, the people are supposed to say a certain, certain distance away. So there are rules and regulations to try to at least abate uh, the inc these incidences. Uh, I guess, has that worked to some degree, uh, uh, but more needs to be done? It's hard to say if it's worked to some degree or not. I mean, the good news is since 2006 at Mahale, we have not seen another respiratory outbreak that resulted in high morbidity and mortality. It's not to say we haven't seen respiratory disease. Um, how much the face mask has played into that is, is unknown. Um, it certainly is causing no harm. The chimpanzees don't seem to react to it. It doesn't seem to bother them. Uh, the tourists and researchers have been uh, very uh, willing to wear the face mask, um, and you don't need to don the face mask until you're you see the chimps and you get you know within viewing distance. So it's not like you have to walk through the entire forest with a face mask mm -hmm. on. Um, so it's a step. It's a step, and I think that um, it's. It's not a bad step. It's a, it's a step in the right direction. It's just not an end-all. I don't want us to sure. get so comfortable with that. Um, and I think, Paul, what it really does, too, is it heightens awareness. You know, and all you have to put a face mask, oh, these, these chimps yeah. could get something from sure. us. Whereas before, if you don't have to stop and do that, if you, don't, if you don't have that kind of potential barrier there, you do get more comfortable in their space, and you do forget, perhaps, that um, you're not just walking through uh, the woods at home. We are where we are now with the research you've done, three, three visits there. What happens next, or let me rephrase that, what would you like to see happen next? Well, uh, I would like to see President Obama's stimulus package <laughs> <laughs> at work um, looking at infectious diseases in these endangered species and also helping the local communities. I think we, it's very hard to go into the, the um, chimpanzee habitat and have such a resource base for the chimpanzees and see the local communities without any resource base. And I think it's justified scientifically from a public health perspective as well as from a conservation perspective that together we have to help um, both the chimpanzee population and the local community and building country capacity. We have to bring in resources that are going to allow those communities to sustain their natural resources um, and, and hopefully prevent the continued spread of disease between people and chimpanzees and chimpanzees and people. How has this experience changed you? There's, there's a broad question for you. How has it changed me? Um, That's a hard. That's a hard question. Um, I think. I think I've been I've been wanting to do this for many 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 years, but actually being positioned so that I could do it with with a veterinary degree alone, I did not feel qualified to go into the bush and and start doing this. I went back to Hopkins in 1998 and got my degree in human public health to really understand disease transmission in humans and, and non-human primates, I felt I ne needed both. Um, the, the opportunity in 2007, 2008 to go to the field, to live in the jungle amongst the people, amongst the chimpanzees, with all the wildlife, um, was, I wish I could verbalize what it's like and, and bring to other people a part of what it brought to me in terms of the, the 
wonderful planet that we live on and what it possibly looked like <laughs> and how it functioned before all the development. I mean, it's really a magical, mystical place with all these um, beautiful animals, spotted ones, striped ones, brown ones, short ones, tall ones, ones with long necks and short necks. and you know, just It's just fascinating the way our planet started. And, you know, if we could all come together and realize that it is one world, it is one medicine, it is one, it is one environment, and um, work hand in hand, uh, human health, animal health, for both domestic animals and wildlife, and find a way to weave it, weave it together so that it works. We're not just, we're not just targeting one thing, but we're really looking at a holistic approach to life on planet Earth. I think it would go a long way. And that's a perfect ending to a fascinating discussion about this whole project. We've been talking with Taranjeet Kaur, who's Assistant Professor of Biomedical Sciences and Pathobiology in the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm Paul Lancaster. Thanks for joining us. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.